Good afternoon and welcome back to the Leadership Institute studios. I'm Kyle Bechet, Communications Manager here at the Leadership Institute. Today we'll be talking about identity as message. And joining us to talk about this topic is Dario Paya, who is an intern from 1992 here at the Leadership Institute, but has most, more recently been uh, a former ambassador from Chile and is the current president of the Leadership Institute Chile. He's doing a lot of great work down in Chile to, do, to, to teach the same kind of tactics and tools that we teach here at the Leadership Institute down in Chile. So we're excited to have him in the studio today. Um, but before we get to today's topic, I want to welcome our in-studio audience. Um, they have joined us from our campaign management school today, um, a four-day school taking place on our third floor here in the building. Building. Um, so thanks for joining us. Um, they might get a chance to ask questions at the end of today's um, webinar. Um, and again, you all at home watching over the internet will be able to ask questions by submitting them to live at leadershipinstitute.org. Or you can join in the conversation today by using the hashtag LIWebinar. With that, Dario, tell us about identity as message. Uh, how is it effective? How do you use it? Well, what are we learning today? Hello, Kyle. Uh, identity is message. Um, if I, well, I know you, Kyle, I know who you are, but for instance, this lady here, what's your name? Marsha. Marsha. So what do I know about Marsha? If I'm a voter and she's a candidate, we just put the name, her name on a sign somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, basically this is uh, what people get to see. Um, I guess they're looking at this right now, mm -hmm. our audience. Um, they see a whole bunch of names. And, and they look at this, they look at all these signs, and they wonder, so who's Marsha? And there's a huge investment, uh, not just the money, all these yard signs that uh, are omnipresent in any campaign. Um, there's a huge investment in them. There's a huge investment in name recognition. There's a huge effort that campaigns make to define what the candidates' positions are on certain issues. Um, but for all that huge investment, I think there's something that is neg neglected, which is critical, which is the question, the answer rather, to a very basic, profound question human beings have whenever they come across anybody. And that question is, who is this person? And the answer to that is not a name. It's something else other than the name. Um, so for instance, of all of these signs, a lot of the signs uh, are like this, Thompson. I don't even know. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. I don't even know. Is it a guy? Is it a lady Thompson? Is it Mr. Thompson? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, and, and this is what we see all the time. Uh, some signs might be funny. And what do I know about this? I don't know if this one is even real. Um, what do I know about geese or dingbat, <laughs> other than maybe something? Um, yet, this is, which I hope it's obvious, that is not an answer to my question, who are you? Uh, it's still the, one of the prevalent forms of, of, of campaigning. Um, so when I'm confront, confronted uh, with, with this, what's actually happening, imagine we're driving, we're, we're in a car together, driving through a neighborhood, and we see one of these signs. Let's look for one here that has a face in it, at least. Here's one. It's a certain Miller with a face in it. So we see this sign, and uh, we're driving. Um, we live in the same neighborhood. We see this. So I ask you. So I just saw this, and I saw the name. And what's the question that pops in my mind? What's the first question for me? It's, who is Michelle Miller? Uh -huh. Obviously, the answer is not the name. I already have that. So I ask you, who's Michelle Miller? And what would your answer be? From that sign, I have no idea. You would go, I don't know. Um, so the question is whether that answer, which is the, the, the obvious answer, um, it's neutral. Did something good or bad happen to Mrs. Miller and his campaign, her campaign, I'm sorry. And 
probably it's pretty bad for her because what you just told me, and I might, I might ask several other people, who is Michelle Miller? Who, by the way, I don't know. I didn't know where, where she was a candidate. That just Google yard signs. <laughs> she came up. If I ask two or three people who Michelle Miller is, and the answer is always what you just gave me, well, I just learned something pretty pathetic about her or Mr. Thompson uh, before, which is uh, that she's basically nobody. Mr. It's just somebody who there's wants to get elected. There was no, there's no story behind that person. There's, there's nothing no, there's for no me no story, to get but, behind. But it wouldn't be f true to say that I don't know anything about him. Mm -hmm. I know it's a candidate or her. It's a candidate that nobody knows about. And that tells me something pretty important about somebody who wants to be elected. Nobody knows anything about this person. Why would he or she uh, be a good uh, officer? Um, so. I contend that when you answer the question of who this person is with just the name, uh, you, you're doing more harm, sometimes a lot of harm, unless there's already a certain knowledge of who the candidate is, uh, that unless a percentage of the electorate knows the answer to the question, who is John Doe, who is Jane Doe, uh, you might be hurting yourself when you are setting you up for people to shrug their shoulders when they are asked about you. Um, I'm going to make sure to stick to my notes so that I don't go off the reservation, which is my <laughs> default mode. Um, what people are craving for is not a name. What people are craving for is an identity, the answer to who you are, how that person is. Um, think of this name. Think of the name Bond, James Bond. And um, in your mind, consider what's on your mind now. You're really thinking, actually you're seeing a story, a way of being, a certain charisma, a style, an environment, a setting. If you're thinking of the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s James Bond, uh, you're thinking of someone rather superficial, uh, womanizer, sophisticated, who loves himself, lethal. If you go to the more recent version of, of Mr. Bond, you're seeing a, a, a troubled guy, somebody who's lovable, I guess, because he, he's got weaknesses, um, he's vulnerable. Uh, is still sophisticated, is still lethal. It's like the war on terror, I guess. Um, there's scars uh -huh. there. Um, but there's certain constants. The, the, the cars, the cool cars, the technology, the watches that do weird stuff, uh, Monaco, a casino, a girl who's also a spy, who falls in love with him, maybe, who might kill him, maybe. Uh, it's a lover and a lie, complicated, like the war on terror, I guess. Um, but you have all these images in your head. And just the name calls back all those images. I could save myself a lot of description by just saying a James Bond type of environment. Um, if I say to you something that is true, if I say James Bond, public employee, member of a union, He's a public employee. I could say British bureaucrat, civil servant. Those things are factually correct, but that's not who James Bond is. Sometimes things that are true about you and part of your biography don't really explain who you are, don't really convey your identity. Uh, so my first point, and I guess uh, I don't need to overdo it, is that uh, name recognition is not, not enough. You have to provide the, the, the answer. To, to, to the question of, of, of who you are. And that first moment of contact between the voter and you, it's critical, it's a chance you're not gonna get, and hopefully you would have something to offer at that moment that would convey your identity uh, in a way that the voter, he, she, will be able to, re to, 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 to communicate to, 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 to others in the future easily. So how do you do that? How do you convey? an identity. Um, if, if I ask you, 
let me give you a word. And consider these words as voters. And these are descriptions of potential candidates. If I say firemen, is that good or bad? Good. I would if imagine. I say veteran, so you all have an image of veteran. Now, let's split hairs there. World War II veteran, what do you have in mind? Vietnam veteran, is it the same picture? Is it a different picture? The, the, even the war of Vietnam, it's like saying, James Bond, it, it, the, there's a whole environment, there's like helicopters sounding and green and napalm. I, I don't know what, what it's, it's different from maybe from people to people, person to person, but for the most part, th there's, so if I say online game developer, <laughs> captain of Team Solomid. Anyone know who Team Solomid is? No? League of Legends? Am I the only geek here? <laughs> OK. Um, talent scout, developer, and producer for the adult film industry. Describe that guy. Describe to me the guy you have in your head right now. How old is he? How does he dress? How does he go about? And I could go on. Banker, shortest player in the team. Who's did that? Shortest player in the team. I just refer height. And you're, I could bet that you all could describe the personality of the shortest guy on the team in pretty much the same uh, terms. So it's easy to see how each word that I'm using triggers a mental image. And with that mental image, you, there are certain characteristics, both good and bad, that are associated with. In fact, more than just mental images, what are being triggered are stories. When I say bond, it's a whole set of things. Um, if I say veteran, Vietnam vet, it's a whole story. It's your own emotions towards that episode, event, or, 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 or set of persons. It's, it's your emotional content, not just your rational content knowledge. All of that can be brought up to the desktop of your conscience. And um, I say image, story, I could say myth. There's certain things we believe as though they were you know, inevitable about short people, about really smart people. And whether they're true or not, uh, these are cliches that exist. And they will most of the time produce the same reaction in most of the people. So you're saying myth and what is actually factually true are just as important to making up oh, you're, the narrative of a Well, of I, a I will get to that because it's okay. a major, major point between what is true and what people believe is true and how they produce the same political outcome. Um, um, so anyhow, w one way to, 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 to convey identity is to use words that tell a story in universal terms, in, in, in terms that people can refer to because of what they know, because of, preferably, because of what they've been through, what they've lived themselves. Um, now, it doesn't just have to be a mental picture. It can be an actual picture. Uh, it can be the simplest of, of pictures. Let me give you um, an example. This is a guy who actually ran for Congress in Chile. Uh, is a doctor, it's a very old picture. And in Spanish, what you can see on this uh, uh, slide, if, if it can be kept on, on the screen, he didn't say his name, Alex Guerra. He, he wrote Dr. Alex Guerra. He's not you know, using the regular student tie. He's dressed like a doctor. And, and the slogan at the bottom, he's playing with words. It's saying in the, in the center, which was his political position, it's the prescription, the word we use oh. for, for re prescription is receta. Uh, so he was saying doctor, whatever, dressed as a doctor, and his slogan evoked the doctor thingy by saying, you know, the, the center is the 
is the prescription, the right prescription. And if I ask you, doctor, is it good or bad? That's a general identity for a candidate for office, especially apparently a pediatrician. Um, I guess it's good. So, you know, nothing wrong, certainly. Um, and if, if somebody asks, if somebody later sees just the name Alex Guerra and asks you, who is Alex Guerra, it would be way easier for you to remember him because of the doctor. If it had just mm -hmm. been the name, it would have been one more of a hundred signs. Hard to remember, but here's a guy who, oh, he's a doctor, pediatrician, the four kids that look the same. Uh, so you know, it's something positive, easy. I'm not saying you've done all of your homework with that. It's mm -hmm. not as simple as that. Um, but you have a good hurt start in, in a positive direction. And uh, the picture will tell the story. Actually, you, with your head, will complete the story. You will provide the images. You will bring your previous emotions to form a movie out of that. Um, not, not a movie, but, but a story with content, with meaning. Um, let's do an experiment here. Let's have an election for prosecutor. I guess that's what you call him. Mm -hmm. um, yep. District attorney, prosecutor, the guy going after the bad guys. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to present four uh, candidates here. First, think of the ideal candidate for prosecutor. I mean, I want to close your eyes. We're not going to do a hold your hands <laughs> thing here now, but close your eyes and think. What does my, the perfect prosecutor look like? Could it be him? Um, I don't know if he's on the screen yet. Um, do, okay, yeah. could, could it be him? Uh, other than that, the fact he's, he's never real, mm -hmm. even if he was, he doesn't look like that any longer, <laughs> you know, kind of. Um, so he's, he's not running. He's not one of the alternatives. Let me show you three actual alternatives, people who, who are running for prosecutor. Here you got three guys. A Mr. Cutter, can, I, I don't know if that's full screen so that we can see a larger detail of this. Uh, we got a Mr. Cutter who's running for prosecutor. Uh, we got a Mr. Hundley who looks friendly and smiley. I'd love to tailgate with the guy. Uh, and then we have Jacob Moore, who's a Republican apparently. There's a little thingy with an elephant and uh, he took a selfie. Um, <laughs> so which one of these guys do you want for, for prosecutor? Why would you elect Hungley? What is there that would make you want him as your guy chasing bad guys? Um, now we know his name, I've repeated it several times, and we know he's running, okay. But what is there? Cutter. Is it Mr. Cutter? Oh, Ken. Well, I guess we know it's a Mr. Mm -hmm. um, Jacob, who somehow won my sympathies, um, you know, he put his uh, resume there. Lawyer, law office, or whatever, his experience, his platform. You know, pretty serious guy. Mm -hmm. um, but where's the identity here? Let me show you a fourth candidate, an actual candidate, not a dent kind of candidate. He's an actual candidate for prosecutor, ex-copper, crime fighter, your London mayor. Look at the guy. Do you want to have a beer with this guy? Not interested. Do you think this guy ever barbecues anything? Pretty sure he doesn't. <laughs> Is there an identity here? Does he exude former copper crime fighter? Here's an identity. So I'm not talking about anything that is too complicated or magical. Mm -hmm. It's just use the real space, use, use the little sign to convey something that people will remember and, and, and actually th th that will score in itself and that can be repeated. Oh no, mean guy. No one ever saw him laugh. Um, and he's been doing it for 30 years. And what will happen is people will complete the picture. People will complete the stories. And a lot of things that are not precise or true will be made up by people. But along this vector, that this has triggered um, because an identity has been provided. Um, there's, 
there's a lot of things, and even in high stakes politics, you have this, the, the, the same problem. There are a lot of cliches, and you use the word cliche here. Is it a cliche to mm -hmm. use the word cliche? Yep. Um, certain things that all campaigns try to, to achieve. For instance, in presidential politics, what is one thing that we expect of every president, or at least the pundits expect, and everybody in politics expect people to expect from US presidents, for instance? Um, it's the vision thing. So how do you convey the vision thing? And that's why you get so many pictures like this. Um, the you, looking off into the distance pictures, the, which you know, will be on the screen. It will be on the screen yeah. in, in, in a second. Um, so we, we have examples here from more than one country. And it, is there a way for me to know if this is actually on the screen? So I can uh, they, they don't have it up yet, but they will have it up. OK, because I want to make a couple of comments. There OK, so here you go. The, the vision thing. So you have uh, Mitterrand looking some, somewhere, and then you have another French guy uh, doing the same thing. And, uh, and, and you know, it's, it's a cliche. Now, you can do it right and you can do it wrong. I don't know if you can see with enough detail here uh, to tell that except two, all the rest of the people are not looking at anything which makes them obvious fakes. Uh, but by looking at their eyes, you in intuitively, you, you know that uh, except Reagan and, uh, and Obama, and maybe Churchill, uh, the rest are just posing for, for the mm -hmm. camera, looking at somewhere over there. And this is our digression. Uh, there's one person in this set of pictures that is obviously not alone. I see a crowd in one of these pictures. Which picture would you say has a crowd in it? There's the idea that there are a lot of people listening to it. Uh, oh, I mean, the only one talking is, is Obama. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He um, has his mouth opening. It and like uh, so there's tiny little details. That, that, that's a digression. But anyhow, there's something they want to convey. They have vision. They look ahead. They look into the future. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is the way they, they try to do it. And, and you know, I, m I make a note of saying, even if at that mistake you can get it that right, hit the nail, or don't. Uh, and, and most of the time they don't because of tiny little details that, that the people intuitively capture. And, and you know when the picture is true or not because you, you, you've seen a million of them. Um, but anyhow, so, so you, you have words that you use to bring up mental pictures that people have in them. But then we also said that what actually happens is that you don't just evoke an image. You trigger a story with just a, a word suggested by the people. And, and the people will fill in the blank. They will complete the story so that it has meaning to them. Um, so I want to do an exercise here with you. It will involve, um, I will say phrases that are true statements about the life of candidates, mm -hmm. um, either them or members of their families, statements that are, I guess, in some uh, way relevant. Um, uh, they're part of the stories, and um, we assume these are politically relevant. Th these are statements that mean something to, to people when they hear them. So what I would like you to do as you hear each statement is to try to make a quick note. Is, is that something that is positive, that makes me like better that person? Does it bring me closer, or d d does it distance me uh, from, from that person? And um, to ex the extent that you can't try to keep score, it will be difficult without, uh, but, but maybe you could keep score, <laughs> you have a pin, pin, pin. Okay, so again, statements about the guy or, or the guys or girls and um, their family stories. Um, it's a lawyer. An academic, a university professor. Parents were not rich, but dream of the best schools in the world for her or him. 
a losing candidate for Congress only got 30% of the vote, but then run again, and then run again. Um, in his family, there's a foreign exchange student that came to America to what he described as a magical place and ended up marrying a girl from Kansas. The family depended on work on oil rigs during the Depression. Signed up for duty the day after Pearl Harbor. Marched across Europe with Patton's army. She, a female ma member of the family, worked during the war in bomber assembly lines. The mother died of cancer. They went to a school on the GI Bill, then moved west in search of opportunity. Another image, a server to the British, someone living in a, in a, in a tin hut, in a tin roof shed, a consultant to a community organizing NGO, living on FHA housing, is that what you call it, federal housing? Yeah. A Harvard boy, all these things. Um, so I don't know roughly how many of this you would consider positive things about this set of candidates. What was your reaction? Mostly positive, mixed, all of them positive. What, what? Uh, I think there was, for me, there was a mixed bag. I mean, you started off with lawyer and academic, which are kind and of it? negatives in my view, especially in politics today. But then you got into you know the the veteran. Uh, how many different ones. candidates would you guess I describe here? Um, I heard about two to three. Two to three. All right. Um, okay. And by the way, you, you you not only get to convey identity, you can convey more complex messages um, with the same methodology of you know, drawing on mental images, and uh, because those mental images are never pictures, they're like sequences. Uh, they have meaning to you, and therefore, whoever draws on them can make meaning. And I mentioned that because I'm gonna follow, uh, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos now of the candidate I was talking about, a single, single candidate. candidate. All of the things I said are true of a single candidate. And, uh, but before we do that, let me say to you four phrases and try to evoke a, a concept. Um, think of the hope of slaves sitting around a fire singing freedom songs. The hope of slaves sing, sitting around a fire singing freedom songs. Think about the hope of immigrants. Think about the hope of a young soldier in the Mekong Delta. Think about the hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes America has a place for him. Um, let's um, watch video one, which I believe is the most significant speech in American politics in the last decade, 15 years. Uh, if we can roll uh, video one, please. Is audio of this video available? Yes. Let me express my deepest gratitude for the privilege of addressing this convention. Tonight is a particular honor for me because, let's face it, my presence on this stage is pretty unlikely. My father was a foreign student, born and raised in a small village in Kenya. He grew up herding goats, went to school in a tin roof shack. His father, my grandfather was a cook, a domestic servant to the British. But my grandfather had larger dreams for his son. Through hard work and perseverance, my father got a scholarship to study in a magical place, America, that shone as a beacon of freedom and opportunity to so many who had come before. While studying here, my father met my mother. She was born in a town on the other side of the world, 
in Kansas. Her father worked on oil rigs and farms through most of the Depression. The day after Pearl Harbor, my grandfather signed up for duty, joined Patton's army, marched across Europe. Back home, my grandmother raised a baby and went to work on a bomber assembly line. After the war, they studied on the GI Bill, bought a house through FHA, and later moved west, all the way to Hawaii, in search of opportunity. And they, too, had big dreams for their daughter, a common dream born of two continents. My parents shared not only an improbable love, they shared an abiding faith in the possibilities of this nation. They would give me an African name, Barack, or Blessed, believing that in a tolerant America, your name is no barrier to success. They imagined, they imagined me going to the best schools in the land, even though they weren't rich, because in a generous America, you don't have to be rich to achieve your potential. They're both passed away now. And yet I know that on this night, they look down on me with great pride. They stand here, and I stand here today, grateful for the diversity of my heritage, aware that my parents' dreams live on in my two precious daughters. I stand here knowing that my story is part of the larger American story, that I owe a debt to all of those who came before me, and that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. So all the things I said before are true of President Obama. Of course, in that presentation, you didn't hear lawyer, community organizer, and several other things. And while a lot of people could you know, say, oh, he's the first African-American president, or at the time could have uh, described them in terms of his race uh, and what it might mean, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is when he was in, actually introduced to the American people, which is in 04, four years before he was elected, at that convention, there was a very delicate and balanced and meticulous way of introducing him in a way that it makes him the embodiment of the American dream. I mean, immigrant, oil rigs in the Depression, Pearl Harbor, Patron's Army, Bomber Assembly Line, GI Bill, Go West in Search of Opportunity, everything's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says it, that he's present there as the embodiment of the American dream or whatever the words are. Um, each one of those phrases, that, that we reviewed before we saw the speech. Each one in itself conveyed um, an image. And you said two or three. It was hard for you to believe that all, th all these things could be true of the same person mm -hmm. uh, because there were some positives and some negatives. And you intuitively say, well, I like that one guy, <laughs> so he cannot be the same guy. Um, they're all true. Uh, and you get to, to select. I also said you can convey. Uh, larger concepts. If I ask you, our audience, so what is the one word that you would identify with uh, candidate Obama uh, at, in, in 08 when he was running? What was the big word? Uh, the, in 08? For him. Yeah, yeah, change. And? Opportunity. It was something in change, actually. <laughs> um, maybe someone. Hope and change. Hope and change. Um, so, you know, maybe somebody came up with that in 08 at some point, they improvised it, or maybe not. Can we run video two, please? This is also from, th from the 2004 convention, four years before the race. Video two, please. Solve itself if we just ignore it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something more substantial. The hope of slaves sitting around a fire singing freedom song the hope of immigrants setting out for dif distant shores, the hope of a young naval lieutenant bravely patrolling the Mekong Delta, the hope of a mill worker's son who dares to defy the odds, the hope of a skinny kid with a funny name who believes that America has a place for him too. Hope in the face 
of difficulty, hope in the face of uncertainty, the audacity of hope. There you have it, the audacity of hope four years before Iran. There was nothing improvised about that. And I think it's a paramount example of uh, the use of images that people react positively, be images that have meaning, and t which to a large degree are, explain are used to explain what makes America what it is, make this country what it is. All personally identify with him through his uh, biography, which I haven't had the time to fact check myself, but uh, you know, there you have it. Um, let's quickly review a couple more of examples. Uh, using the flag, all candidates tend to use the flag. In some countries, by the way, it's illegal to use the, the flag in your political propaganda um, for whatever reasons. Lots of candidates use it here. Sometime for very precise meaning. Um, oh, by the way, there's hope, uh, the, the, the old poster. Um, let's look at this example. Um, I understand this is an actual design that was used, or was going to, uh, or was, uh, whatever, design to, for the re-election of Abraham Lincoln. Save the Union, heal the nation. Actually, the way it ends up might be a that joke, but uh, it made all the sense uh, to use the, the, the flag in this context. It, it has a meaning uh, of its own, unlike whatever her name was before that just had the flag, mm -hmm. because candidates are supposed to have the flag near them. Um, I wonder who's the first uh, candidate who will use in Europe, for instance, uh, something like this to, to describe himself. And, and, and you can just see how powerful that would be, that is, or that will be. Um, it, th th there's so many things that, given the, the context, can be immensely powerful and even overpowering um, that can be conveyed through a little sign uh, so next time you, 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 you just see a name, um, make a note that person is not, uh, whoever designed that is not doing the whole job right. Um, now, as we saw with the example of President Obama's speech, you have a lot of alternatives. Uh, for instance, let, look at this guy. And, and, and let's keep this image on the screen. The candidate here is not the guy looking at the sun. The candidate is the sun. So what things could I say about the, the, the sun is the name, okay? Spell S-U-N. What's the identity? Well, I could say it's a bright guy. I could say he's the guy in the middle. He's the one that everything revolves around. I could say, well, he's always there. He's dependable. I could say energy. <laughs> I could say light. I could say life. I could, you know, the, the, we could come up with a list of 25 things. Now, which one do we want to use? It depends. It depends on what the state of the nation is, what voters, mood of the voters, what they're for. It depends on something critical. Who's, who's the alternative? Who are the other guys running? Because uh, you want to have contrast. So of all these things that are true, you get, you get to choose which one make more sense in all the dimensions we're mentioning. You want to go to those that are, you know, there, there's contrast, are relevant to the voters, um, but I would always prefer those that evoke emotional meaning that in your life, in the voters' life. Um, but, um, but to do all of that, there's something critical you need to do, which is to listen to people. And the best thing candidates can actually do is listen. Um, and candidates don't do in, anywhere near uh, all the listening that needs to, 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 to get done. Um, and let me, let me and, and I, here I'm going back to a question you asked early. Do you know what this, um, what's on screen refers to? It says radio play terrifies nation, fake radio war steers staring through the US. 
It's a picture of a young man there doing a radio show. Who's that guy? Anybody? Orson Welles. Anybody recognize the picture down at the right? From World of the Worlds, of the Worlds, <laughs> uh, the, you know, one of the many versions of a movie that was with, um, what's his face? Uh, who was in it? I have not seen the world of that movie. Uh, whatever, anyhow. Um, so, so what happened here? This is in the 30s, I guess. Uh, this is a radio theater, no TV. And um, Orson Welles wrote a script for a radio drama, which was extremely well done because it simulated, it didn't sound like a radio drama, it simulated a normal radio broadcast. And they would interrupt, it, even with music going on, while the radio thing was gone, the, the, the radio drama, I don't even know what you call that. Um, and they would uh, interrupt this with uh, brief uh, extra news, you know, breaking news dispatches from Central Park. And you know, long story short, they ended up describing an alien invasion. And you know, people running away, and it was so well done that people didn't realize that it was so fake and believe it was true, and panic set in. It's a very interesting thing happened. Th there were you know, hundreds of all sorts of studies done to try to understand the reaction, because this was you know, massive hysteria. And one thing captured my attention, this, this study that compared the reaction of three people uh, in the suburbs of New York. One of them uh, heard this on the radio, was scared, went to the window, looked outside, and saw a whole bunch of cars going away. And her reaction was, this is true. Everybody's escaping. And she escaped. Uh, another lady, somewhere else in the city, heard this, became agitated, went to the window, looked outside, and saw no cars. And she said, this is true. Everyone already escaped. And she escaped. And the third person got scared and said, well, is this true? And why do they keep cutting dust? This is weird. There's something weird about this. And she went to the window, and she looked, and she saw perfectly normal traffic. And she said, this is true. They're hiding it from us, from us. They're trying to hide it. That's why they go back to music. So she escaped. <laughs> Completely opposite evidence on all of them reacted in the same way. This is called confirmation bias. Uh, technical description, I guess. Tendency to search for, interpret, favor, or, and recall information in a way that confirms one beliefs or hypotheses. Uh, if you feel that something's true, you, you believe it's true, and, and, and you act accordingly. So several years ago, I heard a phrase. I've been trying to find who said it, but it was a translation for, from something. So if we can put the, 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 those uh, texts again up on the screen, if possible. The, as I remember, the one I heard, the phrase I heard was, the truth and what people believe is true produce the same results. And I wish I could give credit for someone for that quote. Actually, I can't, because I haven't been able to find it, but I've modified it because I think it's actually different. I'd rather say that what people believe to be true produces this, the political effects I would hope the truth to produce, which is not the same as the first one, because um, they don't necessarily produce the same results. Sometimes it's even worse. Uh, so let me go back to this. What people, let's consider this. What people believe to be true produces the political effects I would hope the truth would have. The fact that something is wrong, it's a f false statement um, that people believe is true, will affect a candidate if he's the victim of that false information. And there's so many decent people who go into politics that cannot accept this and fail. Uh, because they go, but you know it's false. That's not true. We should, you know, we should educate the people. And, and the truth is that people hardly change their minds. I don't know when was the last time that any of us had somebody come to us and say, look, you're wrong. And, uh, you know, that's not, that's a non-starter for most conversations. Especially campaigns are not the right time to educate the people about the truth. It's, as public servants, we have to do that. 
but we have to know that you're not going to get too far because it's the candidate talking. And people look at candidates like, uh, really? <laughs> Come on. And if it's a candidate attacking another candidate, you know, is a candidate. So, so knowing the truth, and by the truth, and this is something to, to make myself clear, between uh, quote signs, I will define for these purposes the truth as those things that people believe to be true. And before you start a campaign, you have to know what that truth is, uh, which hopefully is also, also true. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to have to build your campaign around those things. Otherwise, you're going to be you know, <laughs> hitting head on, head first against the wall at all times. Uh, you have to go deal with that truth. That's, what, that's when listening, talking to people, and good polling uh, come in. Um, because the things that people are saying about you, which are hopefully good and true, um, are the ones that you're going to fly up on. And if they're saying things that are bad about you, you're going to have to wait to, to deal with those. Um, and in practical terms, I'd like to suggest to you that there, this, this triangle of things that all have to be related, your identity, your description in, in, you know, in, in a simple image. Uh, that identity has to be supported with stories, with detailed stories that, that match that identity. And both of those have to be related with the truth. It has to be something that people already know or that people intuitively or immediately accept as the, as the truth when they see you. I mean, if, if I say you're a fireman and we show you in front of a fire truck looking like a fireman surrounded by firemen, okay, so he's a fireman. No, no, nobody's going to fabricate that. Um, th there has to be a relationship with, 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 between these things. You, you have to make sure the truth and what people know about you, the things that the people that know about you will tell about you uh, support the identity and vice versa. It, all of these things have to be connected. And furthermore, they have to be connected to the issues, the words, and the images you use. Uh, issues, what are the relevant issues for someone with that identity? The, you know, there has to be a connection there. Um, and by the way, this is a digression, but I always suggest that we deal with issues in a campaign in terms of the description of the problem. Uh, a lot of candidates and a lot of time in campaigns is spent people arguing solutions. And people are going, eh, I don't know. I mean, got, both guys are good guys. Both guys are experts. Both guys have PhDs in whatever. And they disagree on the solution. Why should I, the voter, know? But I'm an expert as a voter in what? I'm an expert in the problem. Mm -hmm. And the guy that uses the right vocabulary and the right examples and the right stories to describe the problem, oh, he knows what he's talking about. He'll get me to go, yeah, he's got it. If, if, if he conveys to me that he cares, which is another thing, but understands the problem, he, he, mm -hmm. he might get somewhere with me. And, and that is done by the way he describes the, the problems, uh, not, not the, the solutions and, and language. It's, it's critical to that. Now, you have to have an identity because you're going to have an identity. Even if you do nothing, I, before I use the example of all these yard signs and me asking who is whomever, and your answer was, is that an identity? Yes, it's the perfectly unknown person. It's just another candidate who never achieved anything and now wants to get elected. <laughs> so you need an identity. And um, this picture on the screen is actually a picture of my first campaign. That's me sitting backwards. Uh, but now I'm not going to talk about that. It's just to talk about the other guy, the guy that I, that I had to defeat, and how he was a victim of uh, not having an identity because of not providing or defining it. Because unlike me, who was absolutely unknown, he was somewhat known by a relevant percentage of the people because he owned the equivalent to an NFL team in this country. Okay. 
Now, soccer worldwide has a problem. Teams don't have owners, actually. Most of the world in Chile, they didn't at the time. So there's all this thing with corruption, and maybe you've heard about FIFA. Th these guys get a really, really, really bad uh, in terms of reputation. And um, so this other guy who was known by maybe 15% of the people, uh, and people knew he owned uh, or run a soccer, very popular soccer club, actually the club I follow. And he had the reputation of a crook. He wasn't. I know he wasn't. Uh, but since his campaign was basically screaming his name everywhere, he had a lot of money, big campaign, the 85% of the people who didn't know who he was would ask, who is he? Uh -huh. And the only available answer was provided by the market. Oh, the crook that runs this team. Um, he never, he could have, you know, provided an alternative identity uh -huh. that was also true. He never did. So every time people saw his uh, publicity, his ads, he actually hurt himself because he triggered the question, who is this guy? And the answer was, was not good for him. Uh -huh. um, on the other hand, we went with something very simple. At the time, I was young. Uh -huh. And by the way, you, you said I was an intern. You didn't need to say that that was in 92 uh, <laughs> when you introduced me. You volunteered um, the information. Well, I, I ran in 94. <laughs> And I was 20-something at the time, and uh, near my 30s, actually. And, uh, and I lived there. I lived there my entire life. So I was El Joven del Barrio, the young guy from the neighborhood. Young because I was young and because all the other candidates were not young. And because I lived there. And the other guys did not live there. And around those words, which were just images, young, from the neighborhood, people made up stories. Um, actually, there were. Mm -hmm. You know, 60 different neighborhoods in this district. There was half a million people. I didn't say which one neighborhood I lived in, um, but you know, I would run into people that would say, "Oh, yeah, my my son went to school with you," and they would name eight different schools. <laughs> now I had to go through two of them, not voluntarily. <laughs> uh, that change, uh, but not eight. But but I was a guy from the neighborhood, and people actually would make up stories of their kids knowing me. Um, <laughs> But more than that, this is, is a lower middle class, and in some cases, really, really poor section of the capital of my country. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea that someone from the neighborhood was running for Congress in itself okay. was something that meant a lot to a lot of people. Uh, it was a relatable message that it, everyone, all It, it was a follow. relatable thing to the dreams of mm -hmm. a lot of those families towards their kids. Mm -hmm. They would love to see their guy th go to school and one day, you know, run for, co for Congress. It was feeding on their own vision of their lives and et cetera. So while my campaign provided my identity, it was true based on the truth, uh, and it, it, it was something that would spread around easily, my opponent uh, left it to the market and it didn't work out for him. And there's only one thing worse than to let the market randomly assign you an identity, uh, and which one would that be? It's for your opponent. Oh, your to opponent to, 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 to provide yeah. it, provide you with one. And and you will you'll excuse me because I'll make a reference here to American history, and um, so. But uh, this gentleman, Stephen Douglas, and let's keep him on the screen. You know, if anyone through the world hears of him, it's because of the Lincoln Douglas debates. Uh, about slavery prior to a senatorial election in Illinois. Uh, Douglas was senator in Illinois, was running for re-election. Uh, he was a very strong incumbent. He was no way to defeat him. And Lincoln decided to run against him, even though he had no chance. Uh, now, Douglas was the front runner for the Democratic Party for president in 60, two years after that. Um, so Lincoln decides to challenge him. And Lincoln brings up the issue of slavery. And frankly, in Illinois, it wasn't that big of a deal. Slavery wasn't a problem there. And so you wonder, why would he run in an election he had no ch chance of winning and bring up an issue that wasn't really relevant to the voters there? And in fact, Lincoln lost against Douglas. Uh, because through the debates, the Lincoln-Douglas debate, he forced Douglas to to change or to move his position about slavery to the point that he became unacceptable to a lot of the democratic pro-slavery South. And a certain Mr. Breckenridge uh, 
emerge as a, another candidate. Basically, the Democratic Party was divided. It's my understanding that up to Clinton, Lincoln, President Lincoln was elected with the fewest number of, of votes because of that split. Um, so who gave him that identity? Who pushed him into a, in, into a position that actually was not bad? Mm -hmm. You know, in criticize him, criticizing him, uh, pro-slavery people in the Democrat ranks would say, oh, he's no better than an abolitionist. Um, that cost him the election. And, and, and that, that was basically an identity given to him by the strategy mm -hmm. put in place by, by President Lincoln. So um, you, you need to develop your own identity because mm -hmm. either the market or your rival is going to do it for you. Now, last two points. You want your identity to be simple, simple, simple. So who knows who this guy is? Do you know who this guy is? Yeah, it's, uh, Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. And I don't, in this audience here, raise your hand if you know who he is. It's, this is fascinating to me. I used this picture in a lecture in the fourth floor in this building seven years ago, eight years ago. I don't know exactly what year it was. It was two days after he'd won the Tour de France for the seventh time. And, and I'm going to digress here because I think it's worth mentioning. At the time, I asked, who knows who Lance Armstrong is? Keep in mind, he had been in the front page of every newspaper that Sunday, that Monday, excuse me because of what he had just achieved to win for seven consecutive times through the France was just impossible. He had been on every news program the night before. Every TV set in the world had his face Sunday night, prime time in the world. And when I asked, who is this guy? Maybe 15% of the room knew who he was. Now virtually everyone raises his hand now. Why? What has happened since then to now? Conflict. It's corruption. Conflict. Scandal. scandal. Doping. Juicing. Whatever you call it. And um, we pay attention to scandal. It's, it's, it's a sad truth about, but it's a truth about the human nature. When there's conflict, we pay attention because in conflict, we, defi we discover what people really are in how you react uh -huh. to accusations against you. People, if I make an accusation to you, they will look at you and they will look at your reaction rather than your words. We learn about people and about life when there's conflict. And we've paid way more attention to Lance Armstrong because of his um, uh, transgressions than because of his sports life. And it's very, very, very hard to get to be known. But those were the aggressions. Why do I bring him up? He's wearing yellow. He's going seven. Uh, he's he won the Tour de France seven times. You know what the, the color yellow means? Only the winner, only the guy leading the Tour de France gets to use the yellow shirt. It's, it's the symbol of the winner, of the champion, is the yellow shirt. So what else do we know about Lance Armstrong? He's the champion, he's the winner. And he's a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he, he founded, started a foundation. And when he did, do you remember the, or know the name of the foundation? Uh, live strong. Live strong. Armstrong, live strong. What's the main symbol of live strong? We'll get to that guy later. <laughs> Look at this. Foundation, much as the name, the story, cancer survivor. What do we know about Armstrong? Cancer survivor, an amazing story, amazing story. He won all those seven Tour de France's after surviving cancer, metastasized to everywhere in his body. And, um, and the little symbol, this wristband or whatever you call it, is yellow. So in a symbol, simple as a drop of water, you bring everything that is relevant about his story. And whenever you can achieve that, you, you've done your homework. Simplify it, simplify it, simplify it. The reason I had a picture of this guy before, uh, <laughs> So when I was talking about conflict, that's why he brings the rating points and the level of attention that, that he brings to, to, to the election and to himself. Because whenever he's on the screen, <laughs> something is going to happen. And, and, and people pay attention. But that, again, that was a digression. So you want to make it as simple as simple and possible. And my last point, and I can't believe I'm actually going to uh, do this uh, within our time frame. Um, 
Sometimes you cannot change your identity. It's too strong, it's so strong. You've, you've done something so good or, or so bad that it's, it's there. Consider Churchill. A uh, Couple months after he had won the war, basically rescue the West and everything we hold dear. Um, he ran for re-election. At the time, in every town in Britain, they were putting up statues to him, and everybody was naming their first kid Winston. And there's an election, and he did not win. He did not win, because his identity was that of a fighter. You know, that's why he was elected, put in that position. He had delivered. It wasn't what the Brits wanted at the time. Uh, they wanted to go back to peace and to build, build on that. And, and it's not like you're going to start smiling and, you know, uh, kissing <laughs> babies. And it, 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 it was so strong an identity, somehow, sometimes you cannot change that. So let me give you another example, and we'll finish with a short video. Uh, if you think of President Bush before he was elected, what was it, the Texas Rangers? Mm -hmm. uh, he was a you know, fun guy, uh, witty. Uh, and um, not as formal as uh, Bush 41, and, but he was elected and 9-11 happened and everything that we know. So he had to run in 04. By 04, there were all the problems in the war, there, you know, serious trouble, and a lot of people were feeling uneasy about it. But there was no way to, to get away from the fact that uh -huh. he had been a wartime president. It, it's what he had to deal with. So they had to make a call and rather than run on education, he had done this um, no child left behind thing or whatever, um, regardless of whether those policies were good or bad, the, the hard truth is that he was a wartime president and he had to run on that, not avoid it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, was, it was a call, it was not an easy call. So let me finish this by watching a clip using the, two, the 2004 Republican convention, basically where they launched his re-election campaign. It's a longer clip. We're only going to listen to, to a, cu a couple of minutes um, describing how they approach that. Again, drawing on images, drawing on stories, and um, to get around to who he was in 04. So we can roll the third and last video, please. Arlene Howard was at the Javits Center that day in New York when the president went to meet with the families. She had just lost her son. Another man who'd rushed to the fire. Mrs. Howard told the president she wanted to make sure what George Howard was and who he'd been was never forgotten. So she gave the president of the United States her son's policeman's badge. George Bush took that badge and put it in his pocket. And then he told the nation he would keep it with him to remember all who'd lived so heroically. And to this day, Arlene Howard is his friend. He just rose to the occasion. Just about everybody did those days. The president and the first lady had gone to Walter Reed Hospital to meet with soldiers wounded in Afghanistan. In Ward 57, the president met Sergeant Mike McNaughton of the Louisiana National Guard, who'd lost his right leg to a landmine. When Sergeant McNaughton revealed that he'd been an avid runner before he was wounded, the president told him, when you're better, come and run with me. So that's what he did. We were waiting in the White House, and when he came around the corner, and uh, he said, um, are you ready? And I said, uh, Mr. President, I'm stretched, I'm ready to go, let's go. They ran the track three times, three laps on the South Lawn. And then they just hung out for a while. It's hard for a picture to capture a presidency, but maybe a story can tell us something about its meaning. It was October 2001. America had just been hit, and America was uneasy. And some were afraid. He knew. There was a baseball game, the World Series, and it was held in New York. New York was trying to come back, and he knew. 
And suddenly the White House was calling the mayor's office, which was calling Yankee Stadium. It was the first night of the big series in New York. And look who arrived at Yankee Stadium. Derek Jeter bumped into him before he walked out to the mound and he said, hey, Mr. President, where are you going to throw from? The president said, hadn't thought about it. Guess the base of the mound. And Derek Jeter said, this is New York. In New York, you throw from the mound. And the president laughed. He was wearing a heavy Secret Service bulletproof vest and he could hardly move his arms, but he knew. So George Bush took the mound. What he did that night, that man in the arena, he helped us come back. That's the story of this presidency. With the heart of a president, he told us, you keep pitching. No matter what, you keep pitching. No matter what, you go to the game, you go to the mound, you find the plate, and you throw, and you become who you are. So you are who you are. And when people ask, who are you, the answer is not your name. And I hope that is helpful for good people to get elected. Thank great. you. Thank you, Dario. This thank was great. You. Thank you, Todd. Um, we had a great webinar today. Um, and thank you for joining us all the way from Chile. Um, it's not often. I'm assuming you get up here. So it's always great to have you uh, talk about the good good things that you that you teach down there to, to up here. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, and thank you all for joining us at home and you all for coming up from the Campaign Management School to be with us here in the studio. Um, I hope everyone learned something great today. Um, for you all here in the studio, Dario will be available after if you had questions and things like that. Unfortunately, we do not have time to get to questions today. Um, as I said before, thank you all at home for joining us. Um, this webinar, as always, has been recorded and will be online for your viewing later at leadershipinstitute.org slash activism on demand. Um, our next webinar will be in two weeks on December 15th at 3 p.m. And this one will be on a very timely topic of the presidential debates. Uh, there will be a Republican debate that night. And at 3 p.m., we'll be talking with Beverly Hallberg about um, the different uh, what we can expect at the debate and what the candidates do for at these debates. So again, thank you all for joining us and have a good night.